we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. We're going to be talking today about power, the power stone, power. Because it's very important for us to understand the, what, what power is, you know. Um, we know. Uh, we we know the definition uh, that that Spider Man his uncle gave him with great what, power comes what great responsibility. So we know that definition that with power comes responsibility. But there's more to say and more to talk about and define in power. And today I, I felt in my heart that we need to get uh, uh, a better understanding of what it is and understand that there are two types of powers in this world. Amen. Did you know that there's only two types of powers in this world? Uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, you know that there's the dark side and right, and and, and we're and the, the the Jedi's and all these stuff. And you know that there's good and there's evil, there's dark and there's light, right? There's, it's like the yin yang, right? But we understand that it all boils down to two two powers that exist in this world, and it's the power of God and the power of Satan. And let me tell you, last week we talked about that two masters can't sit. In the same throne, right? You can't. Two kings can't share a throne. There has to be only one king. Jesus said that you can't serve money and serve God. You can only choose one. So the options are for us to choose, but the choosing between two powers that be. And I want to talk today about power because it's very important for us to understand that the devil thinks he has more power than you and I. But I'm coming here today to prove to you that the devil is a liar. He is the father of lies. And he, he has power, but his power is not more powerful than yours and mine. Amen? How many say amen? So understand that there's only two powers that be God and Satan. And we go to 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. And it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is whose? Yours, the Lord's. Yours is the kingdom. We just sang that. O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. So there is no one above God. God is the supreme power. Amen. No one greater than God. All of it belongs to him. And then we look at verse 12, and we see that in verse 12, both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to who? To who? All, to give strength to all of us. And the Bible was full of stories of men that were weak, women that were weak, and how God gave them the power to overcome, the power to be victorious. That's the message of the gospel. It's to hope that the weak can be strong, that those that hunger can be fed, that those that are in prison can be visited and comforted. Power. The power is God's, right? Power is the ability or potential of an individual to influence others and control their actions. Now think about this. Power is the ability or potential of an individual to influence others. To influence. It doesn't mean to force or to obligate. Influence means that at some point, the individual will persuade you, will have you thinking uh, a way to do it, maybe their way, or they want you to give them a particular response or an outcome. But it's an influence is only a person that can persuade you to do something that normally you probably wouldn't do. Amen. How you know how many people were influenced to go vote for certain presidents a couple of years back? They were influenced, how? By the propaganda, by the media, by the information that they would read. Do you know that most people picked a president of the United States based on what others were doing? They had presidential debates and on all these candidates, and not everybody in America watched, but everybody went to the polls and said, who are you voting for? Who are you voting for? And those influences made them vote for the very same person. Influence is a powerful thing because us as adults, we have children now. We know that we have to be careful who their influences are. 
Because you know that you can bring a child up in the ways of the Lord. But if they have 10 friends where they spend a lot of quality time with that don't walk in the ways of the Lord, they will influence our children to do the contrary of what we teach them. Can I get an amen? You are in the house of God. You can't say amen. So power is the ability or potential of an individual to influence others. And once you influence them, you can control their actions. It's almost a trance. It's almost like hypnosis. You influence, and once you have influenced the individual, you have a certain control. Come on, guys. How many of us grew up with some somebody of ours, right? And then they were always around. They were always cool. They were always the life of the party. And then all of a sudden, they get into a relationship with some, some girl, and this girl just has a power over them to influence and change them completely. And now Jimmy and Johnny don't come around no more. You got to call. You got to call, text to see if they, 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 they still live in the same city and stay. They, they just disappeared. Man, this ain't you. And then we blame it on love. No, we blame it on the influence of the individual they had over you. We call it ball and chain. We call it check. Am I right? All right. So once, learn. remember this, once you've been influenced, you are now manipulated and controlled through your action. Look at what Ephesians 2 Chapter 2, verse 1 through 6 says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, the prince of the power of the air is not God. He is talking about the devil. He's talking about Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So now this spirit, this evil spirit works in the sons of disobedience. Those that don't want to walk in the ways of the Lord, they, they don't do it by their own means. Okay? They are influenced by an evil spirit to decide not to walk with Christ. So their throne is occupied by another power. The sons of disobedience. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And this is very important to understand because the apostles writing to this church, reminding them, hey, fool, you got saved at one time. You weren't born holy. You weren't born a saint. You weren't born into perfection. You were, you, you were wicked. You, you did sin. You acted a certain way. You lived a certain lifestyle. So don't forget where you came from or where God got you out of. See, what happens is that sometimes we just, instead of turning spiritual, we turn supernatural spiritual. And we forget that we were once in the same sin that the others were in. And then we begin to judge people. Oh, man, look at that attitude. Look at, look at the way he lives. Oh, look at that. Man, but how much of the stuff did we do that we see in others do as well? So Paul is saying, hey, man, snap out of it. You ain't the judge. You're not the one to judge these people around you. If anything, we all were bound to lust. We were all bound to sin. We all deserve the wrath of God. At one time, we belonged to the prince of this of the heirs, the power of the prince of these heirs. We belonged to him at one time. And sometimes we forget, and when a person comes to these doors and they've been serving God for two weeks, we kind of like want to shut them down. No, 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 you're going to have to do your time. What time? You're going to have to go through the loops. You know, you got you, you got to. Step up your game. You got to be here around for a long time in order for you to do something. No, 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 no. Paul is saying, don't think that way. And reminded them where they came out of and how they were able to get out of there so that they can go ahead and be the hope for everybody else. Because look what verse 4 said. But God. I, I want to stop there for a moment. But God, I think, I think this, this is a powerful verse that we're about to read because the way it starts, it says, but God. See, we were lost in our sins, 
right? In our transgressions and our trespasses, we were wicked. We were in lust. We were fornicating. We were committing adultery. We were lying. We were cheating. We were stealing. We were doing so much stuff, right? Because the prince of this world who has power influenced us to live that life so that our actions can reflect it. But God. See, it's important for you to understand that there has to be a but God moment in your life. There has to be a moment where, where things transition from how you were, but God stepped in and changed it. The, 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 the story of the gospel is you were lost, but God found you. You, you. you were a sinful man, but God redeemed you. See, the, that but God means so much in this story because we had just transitioned from darkness into light because of God. See, we like to believe that we're powerful intellectual beings, and we are to a certain degree and standard. But when you compare your intellectual knowledge and your ability and strength and power into the spiritual realm were the weakest thing. In this physical realm, you may have a, a body that can knock out giants. You may have the mind that, that, that can win $2 million on Jeopardy. That guy's breaking records. Answering every single question. You, you can have the brain of Einstein and be acknowledged as, my goodness, this is a genius. Jesus said it back. He says, John the Baptist, born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. But in the kingdom of God, he is the least. That's so you don't understand. You may think you're big time here. You may think like you're doing some amazing things. You're traveling and you're doing preaching and you're doing crusades and you got people watching you on TV. You got, you, you, you're preaching the gospel like TD Jakes and these guys big time. But the Bible teaches me that those guys in the spiritual realm, in the kingdom will be less than maybe somebody like you. Be less than somebody like you. So I want you to understand. But God, at some point, entered your life and turned things around. But God, who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy, man, don't ever forget that. Rich in mercy. We're talking about a God that in the Old Testament would just split the, the ground open and swallow 300, 3,000 people alive because of sin and disobedience. We're talking about a God that, that was serious about, about righteousness, man. And he still lives, but now there's a covenant that, that kind of holds him back from bringing wrath upon us. His mercy is rich. Mercy is you deserve Punishment, but you were let go. It says because of his great love with which he had, or he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And grace. Mercy and grace. I think those are the two words that, that the devil hates in our dictionary. Mercy and grace. And it says in verse 6, And raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So I want to let you know that once you've been redeemed, once God saved your soul, saved your life, the moment that you decided supposedly to accept Jesus as your Savior, that was actually the moment that Jesus accepted you to come into his life and in his kingdom and be part of his family. And that moment, things changed. See, maybe your, 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 your attitude didn't change yet. Maybe your character didn't change yet. Maybe, maybe your outer appearance didn't change yet. But the moment you surrender yourself to God, your soul changed. Purpose changed. Everything came through process, through time. I remember when I first gave my heart to the Lord. 
Boy, was it hard not to cut. Yeah. It was so hard not to cut. And, and for like the first year and a half, I, w- I, I use this statement that, that, that now I tell people, don't you ever say it. I, I, I use this statement that said, um, if you would have talked to me like that when I wasn't saved, it would have been a different outcome right now. How many of us said that before? Boy, you lucky. I'm saved, sanctified, spirit-filled. Sealed with the Holy Ghost because I would have just tossed you out, bounced you out, and boom, through the right, right. See, the reason why you shouldn't say it because in your mind, you already busted them up. Okay. So, so you know what have to ha- you know what has to happen next? You you got to ask God for forgiveness, and then you got to ask forgiveness from them because you just busted them up in your mind. And that's the last thing you want to do: apologize to somebody that upset you. Am I right? Let's continue going. See, I want to let you know that there's power in other things as well. There is power in the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, has come upon you. So we see this, that, 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 that God loved us so much that he separated us, gave us this new life, this new opportunity to, to walk in his ways. But he's saying, you ain't going to do it by yourself because if you try to do this by yourself, trust me, you're going to be like everybody else that's tried to do it, that has tried to done it by themselves. I'm going to give you a helper. I'm going to put him inside of you. And it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, you're going to have some power inside of you that you're going to be my witness to everyone around you. Amen. And I, I, I got a news flash for you. Most people will come to Jesus based on how you live versus how you speak. Okay? Yeah. Because even the most wicked people, Hitler, I'm pretty sure Hitler loved some people. Right? But he was wicked upon wicked. Right? So I just want to let you know that your actions will speak louder than words. And, and people will come to Christ based on your actions and not your words. Not how, not, not how you speak. No, 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 no. By how you live. If I don't see the fruit, the Bible talks about you judge people by the fruit. If you don't see the fruit of the individual, then you know what? I can't go by what you're saying because in reality it's not adding up to what I'm seeing. Amen? You know, Jesus did a, an, inter, an interesting miracle at one time where, where people thought that he messed up. And I'm, I'm so glad that he did this, man, because he took a man outside from his surroundings. He was surrounded by a bunch of people that didn't believe. And, and Jesus wanted to separate this man and took him to the outside. It says he took him to the courtyard. And in the courtyard, he touches the man's eyes. He was blind, touches the man's eyes and says, oh, OK, tell me what you see. And this man says, oh, wow, I see trees. Right. Well, before he saw trees, it says, I see men and they look like trees. And the reason I say is a, is a powerful story uh, uh, that we find in the, in the, uh, hidden in the gospel because Jesus touched his eyes. You expect this man to see clearly, but yet this man now sees men as trees. And when he, when he says that he sees them as trees, Jesus goes again, touches his eyes, boom. Now he sees men for who they are in the physical realm. In other words, what Jesus did was he opened his eyes in the spiritual realm and he was able to see trees because what do you see on most trees? You see fruit, right? So Jesus wanted to open up his spiritual eyes so that he could look at everybody that's around him, everybody that's supposedly in his circle for who they truly are. And then once he saw that these were trees and there's a good possibility he saw the fruit of those trees, Jesus said, okay, let me go ahead and open up your physical eyes. Now you know who's with you and who's against you. So the Spirit of God gives us that ability. Gives us the ability of discernment, of testing spirits. Gives us that power of of making a sound judgment on certain things. Come on, you know. You you, you know that when somebody's about to approach you and they're going to tell you something, you already feel it deep inside like, you know what, this ain't from God. But go ahead, say it. I'm going to hear it. Right? I was one time called to the altar for a pastor, a preacher to preach over my life. And, and I was struggling with it because God was telling me, don't go. 
but I'm such a nice guy, right? That that I, I don't want to. I, I I rather I rather disobey God than make somebody feel bad. Am I speaking to somebody right now? So God is telling me, don't do it. And, and then here I am like, man, but he, I'm going to make him look bad. I'm going to look possessed, God, because I'm not going up to this man. Come on, God. Is there another way out? And, and eventually I was influenced by the power of this age, and I passed up to the front. And when I get to the front, this person puts their hand on me, and they're praying. And God, in the midst of that person praying, he didn't allow me to hear what they said. You know what he did? You know what he did? He made me remove their hand off me. And I was like, oh, my God, we're gonna, there's going to be a fight up in here, man. Yeah, because I took it off with authority. And it wasn't me. And I felt like the Spirit of God was like, take it off. It was like, like they were trying to inject something in me. And the Spirit of God said, uh-uh, take this out of you. And sometimes we don't understand and we believe that it is our mind uh, overthinking, overreacting, or, 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 or over, overthinking. Yeah, overthinking, yeah. And the reality is the spirit of God is in us, is giving us this power, this ability to be able to sense that this is not from God and that we have the power and the authority to cast it out, rebuke it, and send it right back to hell. Amen. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I, that's the problem with the church nowadays. We're not rebuking things like we used to. You remember that? We used to rebuke everything. Yeah, you, you brought out a deck of Uno cards. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You're not going to skip me. You're not going to make me draw for we're not rebuking enough in this time. The Bible says in Psalms 34, 17, that there is power in prayer. It says the righteous cry out, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Man, see, when you're walking in alignment with God and in obedience with God, not perfect, but that you're trying to do your best with God. You know, because honestly, God has some high standards, okay? If I was to say that it was going to be an easy walk with him, then you know what? I'm bringing his statutes and his standards very, very low. But he has some high standards. And, and, and for, for a couple of thousand years, it, it, it was impossible to do two of them. To please God in two of them. So these high standards, God is saying, no, 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 no. If you align yourself with me and you allow the spirit of me inside of you, Anything you pray for, anything that you call out on my name, I will be able to deliver you, I will be able to save you, and I will be able to do the things that you request or require, are asking for. Now, we got to be logical in this, okay? You, you, you can't be asking God for some things that you can't handle. All right? Asking God, God, I want me a, you know, a Tesla car. You only got a part-time job. That's, God ain't going to give you that. Because your whole check is going to go in just pumping gas in that thing. Or it's electric. There you go. You won't even be able to afford whatever plug you got to plug into the power source to make that thing work. I'm serious, man. When I was young, my dad took me to a car line and said, pick, pick, pick the car you want. You got to stay under three grand. I said, okay. Boom, this nice Mercedes, man, real nice. It was old, older, and I guess people didn't want to buy it because it was purple. But I was like, man, it's a Mercedes. I don't care if it's pink, purple, and gold. I'm good. I want that. And I told the man, can I test drive this? My dad says, um, I think you should reconsider your choices. And I said, but dad, this is under the price range. He goes, yeah, but ask the gentleman here, how much is it for a tune-up? So I went ahead and I said, sir, roughly, how much is a tune-up for this car? Well, a tune-up, the good thing about this tune-up, that it, it, it's so many, so many times in so many years versus the average car. The average car will do it three or four times, you know, in that same span. And he says, but it's, it's like three grand. I'm like, three grand? It's like 150 at, at Jose's shop, 150 to do a Toyota. I could do a bunch of those, man, you know? I can't ask for things that are out of my reach and out of my, out of my scope. Amen? So be realistic in your prayers. Understand? And when I say realistic, make sure that you're not aiming for the moon, right? And you still haven't built a rocket and you're over here aiming for the moon. You want to be the moonwalker, but yet you have no rocket to get there. Power in prayer. But there's power in God's word. Can you say power in God's word? 
And do you know there's a difference between your word and God's word? Right? Now, I'm about to tell you that in, in, in the Bible, it talks about the power of the tongue. You guys read about it, right? Power of the tongue. Wow, some people are real good with that type of power. Right? Man, it's like a gift. I'm serious, man. Have you ever talked to somebody that had that gift with their tongue? They can speak something. It's like all these guys work at car dealers. And you go and you tell these guys, I'm just looking, but then you're just signing. Because they have this power in their tongue. You know, so, some, of us, some of us guys, we, we, we have male friends that they have powerful tongues. They, they're like, they get a job anywhere. You're like, man, how did you get that doctor job? You didn't even graduate high school. You know, I talked my way into it. Some people have this power, right? And, 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 and you got to understand there is power in our human tongue. But imagine when you allow the power of darkness to utilize that tongue. How much destruction can it cause? And, and let me, let me, because I know everybody in here is saved. Amen. We don't have to do an altar call today, this morning for salvation. Everybody in here should be saved. Am I right? Can I get an amen? All right. But we are all saved, but there are moments, right? That some stuff rolls off our tongue and you like, whoa, where did that come out of? Am I right? Come on, man. I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking. Go ahead. Say amen. I'm not looking. Because I think everybody in this room has been at that certain point in life where uh, me and my big mouth, right? And things roll off our tongue that shouldn't roll off. And we, we say, okay, it's just words. They'll forgive. Man, God, that opens up a big wound. And then you can't heal that wound for the life of you. There's, there's, there's no flower shop in the world that can repair that wound. Amen. There's not enough chocolate in the Willy Wonka's chocolate factory to get you out of that one, okay? You open up this wound by your words, right? Because you were influenced by something at the moment and the enemy saw the opportunity to come in and use your tongue to destroy. And now the only thing can, that can repair that broken heart is God. And this is the beauty of God. And this is the power of forgiveness. That one, once God enters you and removes devil out of the equation, the darkness out of the equation, and now he is the centerpiece or the one sitting on your throne, now the same mouth and tongue that got you in that dark place will be the same mouth and tongue that will get you out of it. And I know it's hard to believe. Because once words are said, it's almost impossible, right, for them to be removed. It's impossible when you try your very best to take back and swallow your words. But the Bible teaches me that we have a God that forgives. And he teaches this, this method of forgiveness to his people, his children. And at some point, when you speak these words, I apologize. I am sorry. I didn't mean it. I don't know what came over me. God will allow that to be authenticated and unique and transmitted in a way that it calls healing in the person's heart. I know people today that have gone through hell in their marriage and hated each other and even got split up and were on different times, different sides of the spectrum. At some point, the same words that said, I hate you and I don't want you, or the same mouth that said, I hate you and I don't want you, is the same mouth that says, baby, come back. Baby, come back. We'll leave that sermon for another time. <laughs> There's power in Jesus. Second Corinthians 12, 9, it says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. So, so therefore, most gladly, I will boast about my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay, so, 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 so when I'm weak, I am strong. That almost don't make sense. 
But it does make sense when you think it this way. That if you rely on your strength to get you out of certain situations, your, your strength is going to let you down. Right? We see it in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and we see it all the time. Not by, what is it? Not by power. Not by might. Not by power. Right? But by who? By the Spirit of God. Right? Okay. So if, if we rely on our strength, man, we're going to be let down. Have you, has your mind ever like tricked you into believing that you can do something that you know darn well you can't do? Am I right? Just the other day, my mind was trying to tell me to get some basketball shorts, some Jordans, and a, and a jersey and challenge the youth in our church like a one-on-one -on -one basketball. That's my mind. And in my mind, I, I, saw, I saw me dunking on Brandon, like poster shot, you know. I saw myself saying like, next, you know. But and then something about standing in the mirror, them shorts and jersey didn't look too good. You know what I'm saying? I was like, man, you know what? I, I, I'll just let Brandon be. I'll let these young guys be. Because sometimes we think that we can do things, right? Because our mind takes us there. Oh, that, that's not heavy. Go ahead. Pick it up on that side. Pick it up. Oh, oh, my God. I thought this was compressed wood. You come and find out it's cherry oak, right? And it's very important to understand that in our weakness, God becomes our strength. We find strength in who? In Jesus. There's power in Jesus. But there's, there's an interesting thing that I don't want to leave out, and I'm about to wrap it up. Did you just laugh right now? Yeah, because I am about to wrap it up. Matter of fact, go sit on the piano right now. Go sit on the piano. You laughing at me doing my preaching. You sit on the piano. You're on timeout right now. Because I just told you guys what power is. Power is the ability or potential of an individual to influence others and control their actions. So the devil has power to influence. And once he influences, then he can control. But if he can't influence you, there is no control. We are not puppets. He is not our puppet master, okay? We are not puppets. No one obligates us to do anything, but we do what we choose to do, okay? Eve could have walked away. Eve could have said, you know what? I don't want apple pie. I got peach cobbler. I got all this stuff over here. Lemon meringue. I got all this stuff over here. I don't need that one tree. Because God said, you can eat from all the trees. Am I right? Isn't, isn't that the command? Eat from all the trees except that one. I think as soon as God said that one, me knowing today what the effects of it, I would have probably said, you know what? We need to chop that one down because it's kind of cold in here and we need to start a fire. All right? I want marshmallows and that's the only tree that I see we should chop. But the devil was such an influencer that he influenced her to reach and see that it was good. And she ate, and she offered to her husband, her husband ate, and now we're in this whole predicament now, right? But that's good because now we see the love of God and what God's love truly means. But that's power. Power is the ability to influence. But once the person is influenced, that's it. There's no changing of the heart. There's no changing mind. That person is now marked. Bam, gone. If, you're, if your boy, your boy from, from childhood hooked up with the wrong girl and she's controlling them, Say bye bye. Yep, you're not getting that guy back. All right, I am. I am the one that supposedly ripped my wife away from all her friends in high school, and to this day I'm the villain. But you know what? That's all right. I had her all for me. Right, baby. All right. That's power. But see, Jesus not only has power; he has authority. And authority is a little different because authority is the legal and formal right to give orders and commands and make decisions. Meaning that when Jesus speaks, it has to be done this way. That's the way it needs to be done. If God says you have to do it this way, that's the way it has to be done. David thought he could be creative in carrying the ark and he designed his own strategic plan in getting it from point A to point B. And we saw what, what happened with that. Because God has a structure. He has an order by how he goes by. And if this is the way that he wants us to do it, that's the way we got to do it. Can we get an amen right now? 
So authority is that. Jesus has power, power to influence, but he also has power of authority. We see that this authority is highlighted in Matthew 28, 18. It says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All the authority is given unto him in heaven and where else? And earth. If he would have just said heaven, would that make a difference for us? No. Because we don't live in heaven right now. We live on earth. We understand that's where he came from. So his authority and all uh, his authority and power, we're not going to question it because that's where he came from. He demonstrated his resurrection, the power to resurrect. So we know he comes with some heavenly authority. But what good is it for us if he didn't say that he also has authority here on earth? Because the gospel is telling us that there is power. There is power in the gospel. And who who do we find in the gospel? We find Jesus. And Jesus has this power over the prince of darkness, the prince of this age. See, I want I want to tell you this morning. I want to tell you so it stays clear. Yes, the devil has power, but the devil has no authority. The authority belongs to Jesus. And Jesus has given us the ability and the power to call on his name so that we have access to his authority. And what do we find in his authority? Oh, we find that we can go ahead and rebuke the devil. We can cancel out the things of the devil. We can pray for the sick and they be healed. We can pray for somebody, hallelujah, that is tormented by demons and they be liberated. We can pray for somebody that that, that can't walk and they get up. That's authority. Authority. Jesus demonstrated authority when he walked on waters. Jesus demonstrated authority when he told the winds and the sea, silent and be still. Jesus demonstrated authority when he said, Lazarus, come forth. He called them like Lazarus was just chilling inside, waiting for him to pick him up. That's authority. And that's the God we serve. That is the Lord of our hearts. He is the king of our soul. And there is nothing that the devil can do to strip away the authority that Jesus has over our life. See, the Bible teaches us that there is nothing, nothing in this world or in the world, the spiritual world, that can rip us from the hand of God. Nothing. Nothing. And I just want to remind you, man, the next time you see an obstacle rising up, you have the power and the authority through Christ to rebuke that obstacle so it can get out of your way.